No music. I know. I, I... No music. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. If we're not going to play Billy, it. if we're there not we going to play Billy Terrell music, we shouldn't have music at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too many things to click. I know. I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. Tell me about it. I see Sue Watson driving. Don't look at the camera. Look at the road. <laughs> Good to see you, Russ. Good to see you, Steve Foreman. Steve. Larry, Jeff Witherell, Bill Moran, Ron. Beth. Hi, Beth. Good to see you. Don Nemchik, Jim Jameson. We got Cliff Pfeiffer coming in. Bob Flage. <laughs> Roger Junt from South Dakota, Mr. Masters from wow. Canada. Good to yes, see you all. My, my, my love, Elaine, is in there. Oh, you that's your Elaine. Okay, hi, Elaine. Yeah. I see oh, Carol yeah. Wagoner. Good to see you, Carol. Henry Cliff. A lot of faces we haven't seen in a while. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our VBC Happy Hour for this Monday, April 10th. I'm Todd DePastino. I'm the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club. Uh, this is our 15th year. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary of the Veterans Breakfast Club. We're a nonprofit based in Pittsburgh, and our mission is to get people together to uh, in person and online and hear veterans share stories and otherwise just have conversations about the military experience, past and present. Um, we have a slogan at the Veterans Breakfast Club, every veteran has a story. And sometimes more than one. Sometimes they have more than one. I would dare say <laughs> our guest tonight, Billy Terrell, has stories that number into the thousands, not only um, because of his year of service in Vietnam, uh, but also his 60, almost 60 year career in the music business. He's been an, a, a singer, a songwriter, an arranger, a producer for dozens and dozens of artists like uh, Bobby Rydell and Frankie Avalon. Interesting story about Frankie Avalon. Um, Rhea Muldar, some of you may remember her, and lots and lots of other, so, especially soul and R&B artists. He's written so many songs that have or or been involved, written and been involved in and otherwise been involved in so many songs that have charted over the years. Uh, and he's captured a lot of the stories of his stories in his uh, recent memoir, um, which I'm going to show you here, called The Other Side of Rock and War and uh, One Man's Battle to Save His Life, His Career, His Country, and the Orphans He Left Behind. You can see this is kind of a before, during, and after <laughs> shot that give you a gives gives you a good sense of the trajectory of <laughs> Billy Terrell's story. How are you, Billy? You're joining us from New Jersey. Oh, absolutely. Where in New Jersey do you live? Uh, Del Ram, down near around the right about 15 minutes outside of Philadelphia, okay. uh, north of Cherry Hill. Okay. Uh, New Jersey, yeah. Well, very good. And we're going to be talking to Billy tonight about his his career and certainly his Vietnam service, which is harrowing and fascinating. Uh, but before we get to uh, Billy, I do want to say hello to Sean Hall. Hello, Sean. How are you? I'm great. How's everybody doing tonight? I'm doing OK. Do you know what happened to me? I want to tell people just quickly. And you can see Billy's camera is like going berserk. Yeah, so we're going to be We'll, we'll be intervening, taking them off, bringing them back up, see if it fixes it. Um, I got what you call, I'll tell you this, Sean, right before, very quickly, before we get started, over the weekend, or it is Monday, yeah, over the weekend, I got what you call a taste of my own medicine. <laughs> Do you want to hear about it? Oh, definitely. My nephew, Zane, called from Missoula, Montana, saying, Uncle Todd, I've been told I have to do an oral history interview with somebody old, and I chose you. <laughs> and it started with my name and birth date. And uh, then it went from there. So it was the first time I've ever been interviewed for anything like that. And it's um, it was interesting. It was interesting. I, I realized how tough it is to answer these questions. 
you know how did it how did it make you feel <laughs> old <laughs> made me feel old actually <laughs> I'll tell you that, but it was, it was really a lot of fun to kind of, you know, share some stories. They asked me one of the questions, who do you admire? And I, I said, you said me. Well, yeah. Uh, but then after you, I said the veterans that we, that I deal with every day. I mean, they're, they're, you know, I, I, I work with the people I admire every day and that's a real, you know, that's the, it's a much better answer than me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. Right. I mean, it was a given that you would be. Um, and so Sean will be, I'll be hosting. Sean will be co-host. He'll be handling the um, traffic coming in on Facebook and on YouTube and any messages here in the chat, you'll be monitoring Sean. And you'll also be on the lookout for people who raise their hand either like this or with Zoom who want to chime in with a question or a comment, correct? Definitely. Please. Please be sure to uh, raise the hand. We get that notification immediately being the hosts here. And uh, um, if you are uh, joining us from a mobile device, you hit the little three little buttons, uh, three little dots at the bottom of the screen. You should be able to find the, the prompt there very easily. Um, but uh, always interested to hear from the audience and, and any questions you guys have, uh, throw them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you on the program. Thank you, Sean. And we do want this to be as interactive as possible. I think a lot of you are going to have questions and comments um, I, I really regret that we didn't start the program with a Billy Terrell song, but if we had, we would have gotten dinged on YouTube and Facebook. We might've been taken off of YouTube for copyright violations. So we didn't want to do that. Uh, so what we're going to do end up, I think is that whenever we reference a song, I think we'll put a, a link to it here in the chat. Uh, I do want to acknowledge our sponsor, Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Adagio Health is a Healthcare provider. I just went to a wonderful event with Ben Wright, who's in the room tonight. Uh, last week, we went to a wonderful event that Adagio Health had for women veterans down at the Heinz History Center here in Pittsburgh. And it just reminded me of the good work that Adagio Health does. They focus especially on healthcare for families, women, children, and they have a special program for uh, tobacco use. They encourage people to quit. They advocate for healthier policy. For for public policies that encourage healthier places to live, work, and play. Um, they help people quit with this quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And they educate Americans about the hazards of tobacco use and, uh, and of vaping. And you can find out more about what they do at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. That's tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Billy Terrell, did you smoke in the Army? Uh, I've never smoked my whole life. Really? I've never smoked a cigarette my whole life. Is that because it was it would be bad for your singing voice? No, it was because my parents smoked before they got out of bed in the morning. And, and I couldn't I could not stand it. The house was a was a cancer center every morning. The kitchen, even in even when it was snowing, if I had cereal. I would take it out on the back stoop, sit in the snow and eat my cereal because I could not stand smoke. I couldn't do it. It was awful. And <laughs> until I got in the army, when I got in the army with everybody smoking, then unless I wanted to have a fight every day, I had to go with it. I was but it, was very, it was very difficult. I, I couldn't gonna... stand it. I couldn't stand the smell of it. I didn't like it in my hair, my clothes. I just couldn't stand it. Holy mackerel, Billy. I didn't expect that kind of uh, visceral response to that simple question. And back in the 60s, I understand there weren't, it wasn't like there were non-smoking barracks in the army, correct? <laughs> no, no. You just had to live with it. You know, <laughs> right, yeah. you did basic training at Fort Dix and the guys smoked and, you you know, unless you wanted to fight every day, you just, we just went with it. <laughs> I love it. You know, before you continue, it was, it was go ahead. horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> you know, before we continue the conversation with Billy, I do want to let people know we have a special event coming up on Wednesday, two days from now. Uh, we're having Buzz Bissinger, who um, the name might ring a bell with you. He's the author of Friday Night Lights, which became a major motion picture and a TV series. And he's coming to our town, Pittsburgh, to give a talk about his latest book, The Mosquito Bowl, a game of life and death in World War II. And so we are partnering with the Heinz History Center here in Pittsburgh to have him give a talk and a book signing. This is 
the story of a remarkable football game that was played on Guadalcanal on Christmas Eve, 1944, uh, between two teams of Marines. And what makes the game remarkable is, number one, this game featured some of the very best, the absolute top college football players in the country, because many of them joined the Marine Corps. And they found themselves on Guadalcanal. They began debating who was better. And uh, they staged this game Christmas Eve on Guadalcanal. Uh, and then subsequently, many of those players ended up being killed or wounded in the Battle of Okinawa the following spring in uh, April 1945. So um, Buzz Bissinger is coming to town, give a talk about this book, tell this, share this story. Uh, also coming with him is I think the last... Is, is somebody who might be the last surviving member of, he didn't play in the game, but he, he saw the game. He was a, a fan, stood on the sidelines, Marine, uh, Neil McCollum. Uh, he'll be in Pittsburgh. We'll be acknowledging him, celebrating him and his service. So this is something you could see in person or you could see it uh, virtually. You could go online, and and but you have to register for it. Um, we will put the registration link here in the chat. So I encourage you to join us April 12th, two days from now, Wednesday. All right, Billy. This is Billy. This is the early, my earliest known picture of Billy Terrell. This is, uh, how old are you in this picture, Billy? 18? 18 years old. Uh, I was working at the Empress Motel in Asbury Park, uh, 14 hours a day with one day off all month and um, washing dishes, doing my bus, busing tables, doing room service. And uh, on Saturday nights, the band, that was the Asbury Park in 1963 with the Rat Pack days. Yeah. Wonderful, they had racetrack down the road and all the gamblers and high, high uh, end poker games were there. And I was I was doing room service for all these gangsters and high rollers and the uh the band in the lounge used to like to get me up on saturday night to sing and tell a few jokes and one night i'm singing a lot of living to do from bye bye birdie because i love bobby rydell and uh, in town at convention hall was a rock and roll show clay cole was the dick clark of new york he had a dance show and he was hosting this show with Clyde McFadder, Gene Pitney, and Paul and Paula. And they happened to be staying at the Empress Motel. And they were in the audience, and I'm doing my stick. And the waitress comes over to me and said, Billy, that table would like to see you. And I recognized Clay. And I love Gene Pitney. And I walked over, and Clay Cole said, sit down here. You're a talented guy. I want you to come to New York. We're getting you a manager. And that was on July 16th of 1963. I signed. And except for the time I spent in Vietnam, I've been in the business ever since, coming up on 60 years in July. Amazing. And you had, <laughs> you had dropped out of school, correct, to go to work because your family fell on hard times? Well, I had to because if I, if I hadn't dropped out of school, my brothers and sisters and I would be looking for other for each other on unsolved mysteries uh, because we were my father went broke and it was a devastating time and uh, there was no option uh, when I turned sixteen I just I just had to go out to put some food on the table which I did and it was very very difficult because I was undernourished and um, unfortunately. My uh, my front teeth had had to be pulled out, and it was very very difficult uh, going to the eighth grade, graduating grammar school, and finishing the first year of high school with no four front teeth. And you want to talk, you know, today if anybody had to go through that, you'd see a shooting on TV. But that just wasn't my head, right. and. Uh, so when I quit school, I had to go out and work. It was very, very difficult. Every, every business made excuses why they couldn't hire me because I really was not desirable. Yeah. So I ended up uh, shoveling snow, raking leaves, 
cleaning attics, uh, scrubbing the floor at the bingo hall, and uh, bringing home any money I could to put food on the table for my two brothers and two sisters. Billy, you were all but a street urchin with no front teeth. How in the world were you able to maintain like a, a dream or a vision of yourself as, I don't know, something more, and, and especially, you know, a, a show business success? How was that possible? Or didn't you really have that dream? Well, no, I, I had it because I was very funny all through my life. And I remember when my father first went broke, I was the entertainment. We didn't have a TV. Uh, half the time, we didn't have utilities and lights. And I was the one in the family that would always make jokes. I would make tremendous jokes about it. I would sit at the table when we had no food, and I would do a Jackie Gleason bit, one of the honeymooners bits, which I didn't know at the time. And I used to make believe I was eating a steak, and everybody around the table would say, stop. <laughs> it was, but, I, but I had the desire to... I had the desire to move forward. And I always, I, I, I didn't recognize it early on, but I had a lot of talent early on. And I would be able to make fun. And uh, so I, even, even through those difficult times uh, with having to go to work and, and being rejected, I mean, incredibly, I, I, I felt a sense that I don't know what it'll be, but I'm not going to quit. And I think that perseverance is what made the difference. It's funny. I'm, I'm looking at R.G. Smith, another performer, and I saw him kind of nod his head. I think he could probably relate to some of what you're saying. Isn't that amazing? What an amazing uh-huh. story. So, so Billy, you get you get discovered and you eventually get signed with uh, Karma Sutra Records uh, for right. $50 a week as a songwriter. Yeah. Yeah, well, the original manager I had, uh, we went around and everybody said, well, this kid looks great, he sounds good, but he has to write his own songs. And Vic couldn't move me, so we severed that relationship. And I said, okay, then I'm going to be a songwriter. And I was writing songs and running up and down Broadway, going into the Brill Building, into 1650 Broadway, which was the mecca of rock and roll playing my songs for anybody that would listen. And in 1965, I uh, I was putting up television antennas and I was living in a $11 a, week, $11 a week hotel on the Asbury Park Circle, writing songs. And a uh, girls group in town picked up on a song that I wrote called When, which was a nice catchy song. And they started doing it in their show. So in 1965, there was a big mall opening in Eatontown, New Jersey, the Monmouth Mall, which is still there. It's huge. And uh, for opening day, they brought in top artists like Jay and the Americans, the Shangri-Las, and and they brought local groups. And the Shannons, they were on the show. And they sang my song. So some of the promotion people from Kama Sutra came up to them afterwards and they said, where did you get that song? And they said, our little friend, Billy Terrell, lives in a motel down the road. He wrote it. So one night I got back from putting up television antennas and in my motel room, my phone rings and it's already ripped from Kama Sutra. And he said, are you Billy Terrell? And I said, yes. Did you write this song when? I says, I co-wrote it with my friend Ricky Lee, who's managing this group, the Shannons. And he said, well, we would like you to come to New York. We'd like to hear all your songs. So I went up about eight o'clock in the evening, a couple nights later, and they listened and they signed me for 50 bucks a week. And your first recorded song was They Said It Couldn't Be Done, by recorded by the Duprees? By the Duprees, yeah. I was working there. I was, I was, it was a wonderful time in 1650. Bang Records was in the building. Uh, Neil Diamond wasn't a big star yet. Bobby Bloom, uh, marvelous people. People asked me through the years, how did you learn how to write and produce records? And I says, I didn't learn it. I absorbed it. 
Yeah. Because I was, or I, I, I was around so many marvelous artists and producers, and I just, I just let it sink in. So uh, anyway, one night Artie Rip comes to me. I'm, I'm writing songs, and Artie Rip comes to me and he said, "Billy, the, we have a great record by the Duprees, and Columbia Records wants to get it out immediately, and we do not have a B side." So he hands me a tape of a track that they originally recorded for the Shangri-Las. He said, write a song to this darn thing and get over to Columbia Studios and teach them the song. So within 45 <laughs> minutes, I had written the song. I ran over to Columbia. The group was there. And I was a huge Dupree's fan. I mean, I just absolutely adored them. And it was such a wonderful experience. So I went in the studio, I taught them the song, and within an hour, the record was done. And uh, that was my first uh, commercially released record. <laughs> That's a, what a great story. You also then wrote and recorded your uh, recorded yourself your own song, um, uh, My Do It My Way. Is that what it was called? Do It My Way. Well, that was another, yes, that was another track that they had. I don't remember if that was a, if that was uh, for the Shangri-Las or one of the other groups, but they handed me this track that I really loved. And uh, Tony Michaels, who was another writer in there who I really liked, we were, we had written some songs together and I said, Tony, why don't we write the song? And uh, so uh, I I wrote, uh, wrote the song with Tony called Do It My Way. And they said, great. Well, t we, they took us downstairs to Allegro Studios in the basement of 1650 Broadway. And I recorded the song. And as you see on the screen, the studio... Uh, this is after, this is before, this, this record was before. Okay. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen is a reference uh, in 63 of uh, going, my manager at the time took me to Variety Studios and I recorded over a track of Traveling Man by Ricky Nelson. Oh, wow. And this is that record. They gave me an acetate with my vocal on one track and uh, and... The second track is an instrumental, and I used to go around to uh, record hops and sing along with the record. That was that. But the Do It My Way story was I recorded the song at Lyro, and uh, at that time, uh, Kamasutra was just a production company. And uh, they attracted attention by MGM Records for a distribution deal. So they went to MGM Records and said, hey, we're ready to do our own label. We have the three forces, the new forces in the music business. We just signed a group called The Love and Spoonful. And they have a marvelous song called Do You Believe in Magic? We have a group called The Hassles. It's a good group. But the keyboard player, Billy Joel, is the home run of all home. And we have a guy named Billy Terrell, who we feel is the next Phil Spector. And I can tell you right now, I'm glad they were wrong on that one. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. They introduced me as the next Phil Spector, which was pretty crazy. How exciting. And here is, I think, the 45 of They Said yeah, It Couldn't Be Done. That's the 45, yeah. And it was pretty interesting because they went on the Clay Cole show and, and they performed both sides of the records. And my father was very, very, uh, even though he had been in the show business and uh, before World War II, he was very skeptical of my pursuing uh, career in music. And uh, But when he saw that record and he saw the group uh, performing on the Clay Cole show, it kind of chilled him out a little bit. <laughs> um. <laughs> So there you are, 20 years old, you're rocking and rolling, you're ready to go, you know, to take off and you get your draft notice. Well, 
that was an interesting story because I was at Kama Sutra, I was really rocking. And uh, that was 1965. I was there for about two months and the Vietnam War escalated. And uh, I got my draft notice. And uh, when I told the guys at Kama Sutra, they freaked out. They said, oh, come on, you can't do this. And I said, well, what are you talking about? I just got drafted. Yeah. So they called me. This is the bizarre story. They called me to the office a couple of nights before I had to report for the draft. And uh, we had these rooms with these cubicles where we all wrote songs. It was a piano, a bench, uh, an ashtray, a chair uh, for those that smoked and we wrote songs. So they said, come on in here. And I walked in this room that we wrote songs in and then the lights were out and there was a black light in there. If you remember the black lights, it, oh, yeah. your, your shirts and your teeth and your eyes all. <laughs> so I walked in there and uh, I couldn't believe what was going on. They had a beatnik priest from the village in one end of the room banging on a gong talking in tongues and I'm going what in the world is going on here so he's talking in tongues and in walks Monty Rock the third now Monty Rock the third was a flamboyant Hispanic hairdresser who was known as the uh, hairdresser to the stars he even did the Johnny Carson show and he wanted to do music with Kama Sutra, so he showed up. He had, so Hi Ms. Wright, the uh, president of the company said, Billy, sit on the floor, cross your legs and arms. And I'm going, I can't believe this, but I'll do it. So I'm sitting on the floor, Monty Rock comes in, his hair was to the floor and he had a ribbon in. He pulls the ribbon out, stands over me and his hair, I am sitting there in Monty Rock's hair tent. <laughs> and I'm looking out. I'm saying, what in the world is going on? So I stand up. I said, fellas, what's the deal? They says, here's the deal. You can't go to the army. You're, gonna, you're on your way. You're going to ruin your career. So they said, this is what you're going to do. They handed me a pair of ladies' panties, and a brown bag with a dead fish in it. And they said, when you report for the draft and you have to strip down, <laughs> take the physical, and you're standing there with ladies' panties with a dead fish sticking out, there's no way they're sending you to the Army. <laughs> Did it work? No, I said, no, this is exactly what I said word for word. I said, gentlemen, I really appreciate your belief in me. And uh, I understand what you're trying to do for me. But I have to be honest with you. My grandfather, Pasquale Torsiello, who is the greatest influence in my life, came to this country in 1902 through Ellis Island. And he met my grandmother, whose family was from Italy, and she was born in Newark, New Jersey. And she taught him how to speak English. And he was a great bricklayer and a construction guy. And he worked hard. He, he loved America. And uh, he went on to succeed, which afforded me the luxury of being born in America. And if I don't say it, serve this marvelous country, I'm not only slapping the people of America in the face, I'm sleeping my grand, I'm slapping my grandfather in the face. So I'm gonna go to Vietnam. And if I make it home, I'll be back. And if I don't, I can accept that. And I walked out. Wow. So you go, you go to basic training, you go to advanced training. What was that yeah. experience like for you? It was pretty interesting. We went to Fort Dix after, after the induction center where they 
put us on a bus. They went to Fort Dix. And uh, it was a very interesting thing that, that one week or whatever it was before they assigned us to basic training uh, units, uh, because we were, you know, we were picking up cigarette butts and mowing lawns and stuff like that. And uh, I remember it was, it was so bizarre uh, because uh, I was out there picking up cigarette. We, we had these lawnmowers that were open at the top. There was a hole there and you could see the the fan going, you know, the blades. And I remember a guy named Poole. He he was convinced that he wanted to, he didn't want to stay in. One day he stopped a sergeant walking by and he says, I want a dishonorable discharge. And the, and the, the sergeant said, you, you can't request a dishonorable honorable discharge. <laughs> so I said to Poole, I said, Poole, you're out of your mind. Look, get over it. We're, first of all, in 1965, which I'm very disappointed to find out that most draftees like myself were considered the dregs. We were not educated. We were from poor houses and uh, when I saw in the veteran, Vietnam Veterans Magazine a couple of years ago, they had an article called McNamara's 100,000 Morons. And it really offended me because I was in the first 100,000 guys in, in Vietnam in 65 that were drafted. And I really resented being lumped into 100,000 morons. Right. So I said to Poole, I said, look, Poole, we got drafted. We got to do what we got to do. So about a, an hour later, he comes by, he taps him on the shoulder. He says, you know what? Think about this. How are they going to send me to Vietnam if I don't have a trigger finger? And oh, I said, what the hell are you talking about? He walks over to my lawnmower and he stuck his finger down there and chopped it off. Oh, no. Blood went everywhere. Oh. I said, what is wrong? And I never heard from the guy. It was, it was just incredible. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, yeah, it was. It was. It boggled my mind how the guy could do that. Come on, we don't know what units we're going into. You know, I was bright enough to know, hey, listen, we have to get signed to, suppose we get signed to uh, a non-combat unit. What are you going to chop your finger off for? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so and you you eventually did did get to assign technically to a non combat unit, although you know in yeah. Vietnam non combat units got in harm's way all the time. Well, it was it was a, a difficult. Uh, you know, I I went I finished AIT at Dix, went to Fort Lee for a quartermaster course, uh, and then uh, they sent me and five other guys instead of going directly to Vietnam, they put us on a train to Fort Raleigh. We joined the 96th Quartermaster. And for three months in the hills of Kansas, we trained with the 1st Infantry Division and uh, to learn all the tactics and what to look for. And then they put us on the USS Walker in Oakland. And uh, we went over on a troop ship with about 4,000 guys. So uh, here it is. You are one of the few, Billy, who went who went to Vietnam on the Nelson M. Walker. Oh, uh, yeah, there, I, I looked it up. 91% of all those who served in Vietnam went by air, but you went the slow way <laughs> on this well, ship. The early, the, early days, yes. the early days, it didn't pay for the, for the government to fly all these, uh, all the individuals by flight. So they put the battalions on the Walker. Yes. Uh, our battalion was one of the battalions that went to uh, Vietnam on this on this ship. And this, I was just going to say, Billy, this ship has lives in history because of one thing, and that is all the graffiti that you guys scrawled on the racks. This oh, yeah. somebody oh, rescued the racks, and th this has been touring museums throughout the U.S. I saw they came to Pittsburgh. It's fascinating. I unfortunately I can't. There's hardly any graffiti that isn't either obscene or offensive in some way, so I'm not going to show up. Uh, 
Did you do uh, any graffiti on these racks? No, I didn't. But, uh, you know, interestingly, last month at the New Jersey Vietnam uh, Memorial and Learning Center, the display of the walker was there. And I went and I spoke. And they had actual, they had many uh, relics from the ship, including a whole rack of these uh, uh, bunks. Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're 4,000 4, people. This is how we lived uh, on the way to Vietnam. There were 4,000 people on that ship. Look at, look at them stacked up like this. Did you get seasick? Oh, we were like, well, I, I didn't, but a lot of guys did. It was really? pretty rough. Yeah, there were marvelous stories. I don't know if we have, if we have time for all that, but there were there were marvelous stories on uh, on that ship on that way to Vietnam. I'll tell you right I imagine. Sean, you had your hand up. We did a program on that, did we not? Yes, we did. You were host. That's right. I it was it just brought back that memory that we had a full program on all of the art that the graffiti that was done on that ship. Yeah, is it really is fascinating. It really is oh, like a the artifacts. Oh, the artifacts were unbelievable because all the all the soldiers and marines that went to Vietnam, they all left artifacts there whether it's uh, cigarette packages or cameras or I have a lot of photos that I took when I was at the uh uh, when I was at the memorial and I saw this display, it was just incredible. Billy, I have a strange question for you. And it it just, this is about the third or fourth time I've, I've seen a picture of somebody with a guitar in Vietnam. This is you and your guitar. Um, and did you, <laughs> did you bring that with you or did you buy it in Vietnam? Uh, that guitar I bought in a village. I brought a guitar with me. Uh, but over there in the early days, it was easy to uh, have everything warp out. And uh, I went down in the village uh, of Tuiwa and I traded, I forget what I traded uh, for this guitar. And this is in uh, 1967, Tuiwa. Uh, we were mainly living in tents, but I talked to the company commander to allow me to put this tin shack together living there because unfortunately there were a lot of guys in the tents that were, that had hand grenades hanging off their flak jackets. It was during the monsoon season, major wind and rain. And there were so many fights because in the, as opposed to the combat units, yeah, you know, there was so much, racial tension yes and the logistics because before we went to vietnam my company commander came to me in kansas he said guess what because i was very comfortable with the officers and he said the first infantry division just sent us all of their guys that were given vietnam or jail and we wound up with quite a few people that were criminals that elected not to go to prison, but come to Vietnam. I didn't have a problem. I mean, because I, you know, being from a poor background, uh, I related and, you know, I related to the underclass communities. So I really had no prejudice. And every and I was a funny guy. And I, I got along because I had this funny personality and I, I didn't send out the signals that I had anything against anybody's race or whatever. Right. But it was a very difficult time. Larry Holman asks a great question here in the chat. Is this an M14? It's not oh, an yeah. M16. No, that's an M14. Uh, the M, the, uh, when we got there early on, uh, the M14 was a much more reliable weapon. Yes. Because in the early days, the M16 uh, jammed a lot. From what I understand, I never had one, but I heard that it was a that it was a real problem. And we trained with. Oh, Billy, you're frozen. I was going to ask you, Billy, um, you trained with M14s. I think you were going to say uh, one of your duties was with to handle the mail. You were with the 226 Supply and Service Company. 
And I think this is your mail room, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a Connex container, uh, which they shipped stuff uh, from the ships. A lot of supplies came in on these Connex containers. So I, uh, I elected to handle the mail that came in because, you know, I said, I can do that. You know, it's kind of creative and it was a very creative thing to do. And uh, so I talked to the company commander. I said, let me have one of these containers. And I ended up with coffee cans and I put the alphabet coffee cans in there and a little thing. We didn't get very much mail regularly, but when it did come in, I would put it in there and I'd have the guy stop by and, and, uh, and I would Oh, Billy, you're frozen. We can't hear you. I wanted to ask Billy, hopefully he'll uh, he'll come back here with us, but I wanted to ask him about delivering the mail and the danger, uh, the sense of danger that he had. Here is a map of kind of where he was. I see Larry Woods is with us. He was at Tuiwa also. Um, we're letting Billy back in here. I think these are places that Billy all Billy hit uh, with his supply company as he would go from place to place, delivering the mail and other supplies. Larry, when did you get to Tuiwa? Oh, I'm going to ask you to unmute. October 67 to October 68. Okay, so he was gone. He, uh, Billy left um, in May 1967. Is and Billy back the, with us, Sean? Not quite yet. And the Army had a small, they had a, a, a base that was just about, just south of the air base. Oh, that must have been where he was then. Okay. Yep. And Everyone I, can unmute yourselves, though, now. So FYI. They can? Yes. It's going to be crazy. We're going to have a free-for-all. Don't all rush the stage, right, RG? <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, how do you know Billy? What, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, um, I'm a member of the Lambs, which is the oldest theatrical club uh, in the country, actually, probably in the world. And uh, I met him at the Lambs, and we just became good friends. Um, Isn't that great? Some time back. And, um, you know, basically... I'm actually helping to direct and produce his show, et cetera, so, which makes it very nice, and uh, et cetera. So we get to work together quite a bit. Oh, that's so great. Well, thank you for joining us, Elaine. Oh, indeed. I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> oh, this is terrific. I see we have Julia Parsons with us, and I want to introduce Elaine and others to Julia Parsons, 102-year-old Navy wave who served in World War II as a code breaker. Uh, Julia? I'm going to let everybody know that you had COVID. How are you feeling now? Oh, we can't hear you. Darn it. It must be the ear. If you could unplug maybe and plug your earphones back in. There we go. Now, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah. How oh, are you good. feeling? Good. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm tired, but that's uh, to be expected. And let me say, if anybody doesn't have their shots, for goodness sakes, get them and get the uh, packs loaded as soon as you can. It's just amazing. So, it made you feel a lot better quickly, huh? Yes. Yes. And I okay. feel very good now. And I've had my last dose of the packs loaded. So that's good. Now I can get back in the world again. <laughs> And are you still going, you still plan to go to Connecticut this week? I'm still making up my mind. Okay. I'm pretty tired. I don't know. I think you're too tired to go. That's my opinion because <laughs> we have a breakfast on Friday. And if you don't go to Connecticut, you could come to our breakfast. And I would too. <laughs> Not that I'm selfish or anything like that, but um, but no, seriously, I, I do hope that you feel better that you could go to Connecticut. But if you don't, if you feel like you don't want to go, we'd love to have you on Friday. And I should let people know 
that we're having. Uh, this, this is kind of a, you know, we're the Veterans Breakfast Club. And so we are, our in-person events are generally breakfast. This is something that we're trying. It's a little bit different than we, we've done in the past. We're having a 10 a.m. event instead of our event starting at 8.30. We're going to have 10 a.m. There won't be a buffet breakfast. It'll be coffee and Danish, kind of a light refreshments, light breakfast, and it'll be free of charge. We're having a Beulah Presbyterian Church, which is in Penn Hill. So anybody who's in Western Pennsylvania who would like to join us, so I urge you, please do join us. This is a good entry-level kind of event that we're doing. There's no cost to you. Just come Friday, April 14th at 10 a.m. Uh, Sean and I will be there setting up at 9 a.m. And along with Ben uh, Wright, who's with us here, Jim Jamison might, I might be able to twist his arm to get him to come along also. Uh, Betty Karleski will be with us. We'll be setting up. Putting, making the coffee, putting out the coffee, putting out the Danish. And then we will start a program at 1030 and we'll have veterans sharing stories until noon. And I know for a fact, Domenico Carcidi will be with us. This is Domenico. He was a diver in World War II. He uh, called me to say, how do I get to this church? And I gave him directions because I definitely want him to come. He has wonderful, wonderful stories. So please join us if you're going to be in Western PA. would love to have you join us for this in-person event uh, Billy is gone and he's not back. Is he Sean? I do not see him as of yet. All right. Let me see if he's trying to contact me. Sometimes that you, yeah, while you do that, I'll let everybody know about the current scuttlebutt that is happening right now. Um, so if you don't know, uh, I also host the VBC's podcast, which is called the scuttlebutt. Um, this podcast is pre-recorded, and we re usually release it on YouTube and across podcast platforms. So if you know about podcasts, you usually can just search like on Apple, uh, you know, Apple or iTunes. Um, you can find the scuttlebutt and find uh, what we're doing. But over the last couple of weeks, uh, we haven't released our own episode because I was asked by the Warrior Next Door podcast uh, gents to come on to their podcast. Um, they have a different format than I do. I sort of do, you know, almost like coffee talk. Like we sit down, we hear about a veteran story. We talk about what they're into or what organization uh, they're with. Usually, you know, I might have on representatives of the Navy or the Army, you know, we'll talk about JRTC, different things on the scuttlebutt, but their their format's a little different. They've done well over 100 interviews of World War II veterans that they submit to the Library of Congress. And what they decided to do with all these interviews is they created uh, a podcast where they will listen to pieces of this interview and then give historical context around the, the veteran's story. It's really wonderful. Uh, they're both uh, sort of yeah, they they would say that they, as they appeared on the scuttlebutt, they would say that they're um, they're both scientists, but they love to be, you know, sort of what would you call that, Todd? Like an armchair historian? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So uh, they, uh, I appeared on their podcast, and we talked about uh, a World War II veteran who saw something that I don't know if, if someone raised their hand if you heard about this, the Battle of Los Angeles. <laughs> Todd. So yeah. what was the Battle of Los Angeles? The Battle of Los Angeles was something that wasn't a battle. It was this it was this really scary event that happened in February 1942, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and um it followed a, a an actual event where the Japanese lobbed a few shells at uh oil rigs in Santa Barbara. Um and this is still, you know, early after Pearl Harbor, people on the West Coast especially are jittery about a Japanese invasion. And so everybody in Los Angeles, Southern California, they were like on alert. The rumor was, rumors were going crazy that the Japanese were about to uh, invade. And so all you could picture all these, you know, uh, uh, batteries, anti-artillery or anti-aircraft batteries, uh, all kind of with trigger fingers, itchy trigger fingers, scanning the night. Somebody said they saw something and one of the guns went off. That prompted the battery next to it to go off. Soon, you know, <laughs> within minutes, the whole sky just exploded with American, you know, artillery guys shooting into the sky. It was probably a weather balloon or something like that or well, nothing that's the at thing all. Is that, yeah, that's the thing is that no one ever really figured out the truth of this. Now, there was an inquiry later after the war and they say, well, yeah, it was probably probably a weather balloon um, that, that went up. But I mean, L.A. was an, under full blackout. So yeah. everybody on the ground. And what was really crazy is that if anybody left their lights on, you didn't want to leave your lights on because 
people were going out and smashing windows to get their lights up. They were, it was, they were terrified. Um, so yeah, like Todd said, the entire sky lit up with anti-aircraft fire. Um, everybody that was a part of this remembers it. The veteran that, that they interviewed and the, what we sort of dove into, he was a part of uh, the the Japanese attack on the uh, the, the oil rigs. And um, and he was a, a part of this really obscure piece of history that happened for one night that nobody kind of knows uh, what or why was going on. Um, but we get into his history and it's being released in three parts. So part one and part two uh, have already been released. Part two was today and part three will be released next Monday. You can find it in our e-blast. So if you get the e-blast, uh, you can go right through on that link and um, and find that episode uh, from the Warrior Next Door podcast, which I would highly recommend all of their podcasts. They're a great group um, and you can check them out. I did a little article on this uh, for our VBC blog. I put the link in the chat here. And Greg Yost, you're absolutely right. Definitely a UFO. That is the scuttlebutt on the internet. It was is this was a UFO in 1942, and uh, so it was part of an alien invasion. Uh, that's the consensus among historians, and I totally believe it. Look, if Billy's not going to return, we're just going to do open conversation for the next 40 minutes. How's that? I'm game. All right, all right. Open conversation. Um, we're going to start with Bill Boswell. Bill. And I know Ben Wright also knows a lot about the Project 100,000. Bill Boswell, you put in an interesting little summary of what Project 100,000 was. And if you want to unmute and let us know a little bit more about it, we can start there. Is Bill with us? Maybe Bill left. Okay. Ben? Yes, we. I had uh, several of the Project 100,000, there were probably seven or eight that joined uh, my flight in basic military training in the Air Force. And uh, they did have all sorts of issues. Um, most of them had been in a proficiency flight where they in a basic training environment, they were teaching them to read. And the goal was to get them to a third grade reading level wow. so that they would be able to read technical orders. And uh, I had a guy in the bunk next to me. He had been through, he couldn't do push-ups. So they'd sent him to uh, physical conditioning flight for a while uh, to work on that. And then he was in corrective custody for a while because he stole somebody's underwear. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you, you know, at, at, at all these guys, they put them in a flight and they all said, we have to graduate with this flight or we're going to be discharged. Uh, because they had to finish basic training, which at that time was a six-week program, within six months. Uh, so that tells you how long they'd been there. And, wow. uh, you know, it, it was the guy in the bunk next to me, he just had a black cloud over his head. I always oh. wondered what happened to him. You know, he did try to mark his uniforms and he'd spill all the ink, uh, you know, that we had to have these spit and polish floors and all that. And... Uh, he thought he was finally going to get to leave Lackland and got his orders and he was going to go to security police, which meant he was going to stay at Lackland to go to security police school. <laughs> so I don't know what ever happened to him, but it was an interesting bunch. And some of them have been in trouble with the law mm -hmm. uh, for various things and they still let them in or yeah, I guess. Yeah. RG Smith. Hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Um, there's a book called McNamara's Folly. I read it. It's it's a little thick, but it's an easy read, and it's many many chapters about Project One Hundred Thousand, which they estimate really turned out to be about three hundred thousand. Wow! You can order it wherever you get your stuff. It's a good read. I passed it along to somebody else that was curious about the topic, and it was just the sign of the times too. You shake your head and say, "How how could they or why did they?" Well, you figure it out <laughs> by now. It's history. So is there any? Know. Is there any estimate as to the number of that 300,000, say, who made it through basic training, made it through their service, and separated with an honorable discharge? I wonder, are we talking one in 10, five in 10? You know, I don't think it was tracked that way. No. The way the personnel moved in and out with individuals being plugged in and plugged out constantly over all those years, that would be tough to find. Plus, they, would, they, they didn't want to talk about this. Yeah. This wasn't something you were proud of. Right. 
Right. Trey Berman, you had your hand. Good to see you, Trey. At least I saw your name. Thank you. Where are you? Uh, I'm hey, in what? Annapolis. How are you? How's it going? Um, I'm I'm in Annapolis right now. My camera's not working, so I can't have it on. But I've just been, you know, I just got back from South Carolina. I hung out with uh, uh, my grandfather, you know, all that. Um, you were talking. I was watching on YouTube, and then I came over here because I wanted to talk about this when I heard open discussion. Uh, and you were, you were talking about the Battle of San Francisco, uh, not San Francisco, the Battle of uh, Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, my grandfather, my other grandfather, not the one that you know, <laughs> um, not Jim Wojcik, but my other grandfather who lived in Annapolis um, before he died, he was living in San Diego at the time and remembers the sky like turning to day um, with the anti air rounds. <laughs> Wow. Because there were just so many. Because one gun would go off and another would see one gun shooting and they'd say, oh, we should shoot. And yeah. all of them would go up. But what's interesting is everyone's, a lot of people have heard about the Battle of Los Angeles, or, well, not Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, during World War II. What they don't remember is the Battle of San Francisco during the Korean War that oh. my grandfather, the one that was living in California at the time, served in. Huh. And. That was a, it wasn't, no shooting took place, but it was when we were aware, afraid of, I believe we they called it the TU-4, and it was a Russian bomber, and it was a copy of the B-29, but theoretically, it could hit San Francisco. Yes. So, what did they do? They put, they took a bunch of anti-aircraft weapons that were coming off of decommissioned battleships at the time, and threw them all around San Francisco, and he was a quad 40 millimeter gun gunner during the uh battle well, of let me see. uh san francisco in right, the korean I'll war call you back. so that was kind of cool that's very cool the battle of san francisco i'm going to look that up open conversation over because we have billy terrell back hey billy i hope so hang on one second <laughs> who are you talking to this billy is, this is bizarre this is bizarre it's always the showbiz guys who, you know. Uh, we're, we're the worst. Can you, hear me? The worst. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for joining us again. I can't see you. Now I got to figure out how to get back in to see you. This is bizarre as it gets. Uh, well, well, Billy, but, you know, we can hear you. And if you could hear me, we could just go from here. We might we might want to go from here because this is this is a, this, I, I I can't believe it. But uh, anyway, the only well, explanation at Brad Washball, you're right. UFOs, the only explanation for this. It says here the host has stopped your video. Yes, we have. Okay, but we can hear you. Okay, Elaine. I know you were waving your hand. You wanted to say something, Elaine. I'm asking you to unmute. All right. Uh, yeah, I was just going to tell you that uh, he was on the phone. I was. I called him to tell him what to do. <laughs> oh, thank you that's so who, much. That's who he was. That's who he was talking to. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you, Elaine, for helping us oh, out sure. here. Okay. Good. Uh, Billy, All right. There you go. Billy, I'm showing a map here of South Vietnam, where some of the places that you you served. I know that you were based out of Tuiwa, but it looks like you you did a lot of traveling up and down the coast, to, all the way to Duc Phu and down to Phan Rang. Were you yeah. delivering mail and other supplies? Well, it was, uh, yeah, at, at di different <laughs> at, at different times, it was interesting. Uh, when, when we got to Vietnam, we uh, we got off the ship, the Walker, uh, at Cameron Bay. And uh, Company A stayed in Cameron, lucky them. And Company B, we got sent down to Phan Rang, and then we were redesignated the 226 Appliance Service. Okay. Uh, and then from there, uh, we were down there a bit, which was which was no party. And then we uh, ended up in Tuiwa in uh, July, I think late July of '66. And formed, uh, you know, started uh, to establish a, a base camp there. 
Uh, and, uh, and then from there, we did a lot of operations. Uh, DOCFO was the, was the worst. And I was only uh, in May of 67. I had been in country uh, about 11 months. Right. And uh, we, uh, Lieutenant Klempner had to go up to DOCFO and he asked me to come along. He says, I'd like to have you along because I was a little more experienced. And uh, with about 19 days left to go in Vietnam, Duck Pho was the was the absolute worst. It was just awful. And that's and when you were attacked on a convoy, right? I didn't think I, I really didn't think I was going to survive that. You know, it was really, really terrible. Well, it was at the base of this mountain that was uh, mined back when the French were in Vietnam, and uh, we. Uh, got off the uh, chopper at a fire base and we joined a convoy and uh, we were in toward the back of the convoy in a uh, three quarter ton truck. And Lieutenant Clinton was standing up, you know, and he was had his hands on the roof of the truck. And I sensed something was very, very wrong. And I said, uh, Lieutenant Clinton, I said, you better get down here. I, I laid flat in the truck I put a clip in and, uh, you know, put around the chamber just in case. And I, I said, Lieutenant, I, something's wrong. There's no birds. And he said, what are you talking about birds? And I said, there's no sounds. There's no, it's, there's no sounds. Something's going to happen. And I was petrified. And about two and a half minutes, three minutes later, yeah, we got hit from both sides. It was just a very terrible, terrible time. Oh, boy. Uh, and another terrible time was when you got malaria. Well, that was really, that was really bad. That was, uh, that was uh, November of 66. I had only been in country. Let me see. I got in country. The first week in June, July, August, September, October. I was in country about a little less than six months. And uh, it was during that monsoon thing. And I was wet all the time. And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't realize, you know, I, di I didn't realize how bad off I was. I didn't feel well, but I didn't pay much attention to it. And uh, we were on a convoy. With uh, fortunately, we shared our base camp with Korean Rocks, which were a blessing because they were great protectors. And uh, I became extremely ill. And uh, one of the uh, Korean guys put me in a Jeep and we were close to North Tuiwa. And they took me to 36030 VAC uh, on a hill north of North Tuiwa and uh, put me in, in the, there was a medivac tent there. And it was a pretty heavy casualty day. So the guys that were sick as opposed to being wounded were wrapped up in ponchos and put outside the tents. And that was a, the rain was so bad, the medivac choppers couldn't get in there right away. So it took until the next morning. And uh, finally, uh, a dust off got in there and they took me and a couple of other guys down to 67th EVAC in Queenon. And uh, I was there a day or so. And then they decided to send me to 8th Field in uh, Trang, where they had a lot of, you know, a lot more equipped to deal with some of these issues. And I was running 105 fever. And my my right foot, part of my right foot was rotting off from jungle rot, Ugh. and it was it was just a in a it was just an awful situation. Life threatening and, situation. Oh, it was a life threatening. Well, I remember when they brought me in. It was a heavy casualty day, so they put me. When we got to Natrang, they put me on a on a, a I guess a bed or. A, whatever it was, foggy now, uh, inside the entrance to 
uh, tent city, because that was called tent city. There were tents with uh, sandbags and there were different wards. And uh, I heard uh, a doctor say to one of the medics, you better ice this guy. He's running 105. He's not going to make it. Mm -hmm. So they took me in and they threw me in a bin of ice water. Ugh. And I can tell you, I, that, was, that was absolutely unbelievable. And uh, so they put me in bed and uh, the doctor said to the medic, I want you to check this guy's vitals every 30 minutes. Every hour, I want you to give him a shot. And if he is with us in the morning, we'll have a chance. Wow. And uh, that was a horrific night for me because it was between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And the Red Cross had put Christmas lights along the tent. And I was so worried about my mother because my mother was very fragile. And I was so afraid to disappoint my mother and break her heart. And I fought not to sleep. And the next morning, I didn't know I woke up because the first thing I saw was this bright light. Mm -hmm. I mean, extreme bright light. And I'm figuring, I'm out of here. Let me start looking for relatives. <laughs> 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 that way i hope <laughs> rather than, so uh, looking for relatives in heaven i thought i thought i was out of here and about two minutes later i realized that there were sandbags and there was about three feet between the sandbags and the tent and i realized it was the sun coming over the sandbags wow and i had made it at least that far so later that day, they cleaned me up, and I felt a little bit better. I was I went down to eighty nine pounds. I had no muscle. I had no strength at all. I was just I was pretty much done. And in walks Martha Ray, who was a comedian and wonderful entertainer, but she was also a an army nurse, and her uh, she was at the rank of colonel. We called her Colonel Maggie, and she walked into the ICU tent with Cardinal Spellman of New York and Reverend Billy Graham. That's a pretty good uh, triumvirate there for right. you. So I'm laying in bed, and Martha Ray is holding my feet. And she's saying, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Hang with us. Stay with us. And uh, Billy Graham, Reverend Billy Graham was holding my right hand. And Cardinal Spellman put a crucifix around my neck and gave me last rites. Wow. And uh, one of the only regrets I have in my whole life is I was so messed up on alcohol when I got home from Vietnam. I hot that crucifix for the price of one drink. Oh, boy. Very sad time. And you made it. But instead of sending you kind of somewhere where you could recover they sent you back to your unit that i don't get well it, it was a technicality i thought they were going to send me either to the philippines and then home or offshore and then home and i even said to the doctor i was 89 pounds i couldn't lift a spoon i couldn't even lift a spoon there was a table on the side and there was a spoon i i didn't have the muscle tone to the strength to even lift a spoon and I had said to a doctor that came in, I said, uh, I, I guess I'm going home. And he said, no, because you weren't in one facility more than 31 days. 
Got it. I said, yeah, but I was in 67 D-back. I was in uh, 363. I was in Queen Anne, and I'm in uh, Trang. And they said, no, you had to be 31 days in one facility. So finally, they got me out of bed. They put me on a chopper, and I went back to my unit in January of 67, and I had to go until May. Wow, we one bright spot from your service was uh working with these orphans uh well, north of Tuiwa. Yes. Well, the Manglang Orphanage in Tui An up in Funian uh, province in early September 66 was heavily attacked. And we were supporting, we were direct support for the 101st Airborne as well as 4th Infantry and the Rocks. We were, we were direct support for a lot of important units. And uh, so they went in and uh, we wound up rescuing 110 orphans and Catholic nuns, reload, relocated them to Tuiwa outside of our base camp in the, in the village of Tuiwa, and they had a, uh, a hospital, a real small hospital, with dir dirty as you can imagine. And they had these children stacked up on like firewood on top of each other. You couldn't even walk between the bunks. And uh, so about a week later, Two Catholic nuns wandered onto our base camp with these burlap bags, and they were scavenging food. Now we were eating, we were eating World War II sea rations. Right. The sea rations that were brought into us from were a surplus from World War II. So any any of these cans that were slightly damaged, we had to put in pits and burn them because it was contaminated. So the nuns came in and they went over to one of these pits and they started scavenging these cans. And Lieutenant Shear, rest his soul, he stopped them and convinced them that this food was, it's no good. So he gave them $10 of military script to buy food. And the next day they came back with a Catholic priest who spoke enough English to let us know of the conditions of our babies in Tuiwa. And we went down there and what we did is we started taking up collections riding home to churches and parishes. And we got enough money together. Lieutenant Shear was able to, uh, you know, turn the cash over into a high rate of exchange rate. And we bought a plot of land and we built Mang Lang Orphanage in Tuiwa. Mm. And it's still there today. Still there today, and I know you went back to visit, and we'll get back to that. But can I ask you about your uh, flight home, about your return home? Um, what was it like to come home in May? That would have been May 1967. Yeah, it was well. I left Vietnam. Well, when we got back, uh, let me backtrack just a touch, if you don't mind. When Lieutenant Clintner and I got back to base camp in uh, from uh, Duck Vo, we were still ghost white because we were convinced we were going to die. Yeah. And, uh, so I went into Captain Bond and uh, he said, hey, your orders came through. And I said, good, because I don't think I could do this. I don't think I can go through this again. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he uh, said to me, he said, I'm sending it down to Conron Bay a little bit early. Uh, just settle in there and hang out because your orders came through to leave Vietnam on May 29th. 
And uh, so uh, I was down there and uh, myself and quite a few other, about 150, I guess, I guess that Northwest Orient flight, probably uh, there were 150 people on that, guys, all different units and ranks. And uh, we were on the plane, we got on the flight, and I can tell you that you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. It was totally silent. And uh, we were holding hands. All of our eyes were closed. And we were holding hands as we taxied down the runway off Cameron Bay. You could hear a pin drop. Yes. And we were all eyes closed, praying that we would get off the ground. And as we lifted off and we went out over the water, the pilot came on and said, gentlemen, if you look out the right side of the plane, you'll see, see the last of Vietnam. Mm. And I can tell you that that plane erupted an enormous, enormous amount of tears. And we were hugging each other. It, it's devastating even today. Yeah. We were, and I believe that we all felt the same. Our mothers were, sp were spared. Right. Your mothers were spared. Yes. You were spared in a sense. But in another sense, Billy, that homecoming that you were so anticipating, and I've, I'm looking at our Zoom room. I see a lot of other Vietnam veterans, and I think they would share this memory with you. The homecoming that was so anticipated turned out to be uh, you know, d disappointing at best. And really traumatic at worst. I mean, you came back to a home front that definitely wasn't grateful for your service, and it wasn't quite the same place you had left. Well, yeah, but I, but I have, you know, over the years, I mean, I really uh, thought this through. Uh, and uh, you're right, uh, but I've come to the conclusion it was very difficult. I mean, it wasn't as bad, quite as bad in 67 as it was after 10 and 68. Right. But right. I did have a lot of resentment. I did sense a lot of resentment. And being in the music business was very difficult because the music business was very liberal and bought into the uh, media that totally trashed Vietnam. They did they didn't bother looking at the whole picture. They they ignored the humanitarian side of the war, which was tragic because it wasn't only me and my unit. There were units all over Vietnam, 173rd Airborne in Hue, and they are still supporting their, their orphanage until today. There were orphanages in Ku Chi all over South Vietnam. We were not baby killers. There were a handful of idiots like Cali and that group uh, that went out of their way to hurt the people. But for the most part, most of us in Vietnam, we, we did not abuse those people. We helped those children. We helped the people. And that's what made it very difficult coming home because the media just completely overlooked the humanitarian and they and the, the real tragedy in my mind was they never gave the nurses in the in the field and medivac hospitals they never shined a bright light on them which is terrible because the nurses were just absolutely incredible i don't know how they did it and a lot of us wouldn't have survived without the care and the support of the nurses in Vietnam. 
Billy, I'm looking at the clock. I see we have about 10 more minutes left in the program, and I want to cover some of your post-war career here. Dan sure. Pecunis, I also want to welcome Dan Pecunis here because uh, he and I have corresponded. I've not met him. He's out in California. He was a, uh, a, a, a fighter pilot, F-4 pilot in, in Vietnam, 200-plus uh, missions. He's going to be a guest uh, this summer. We're looking, and he put in the chat, Dan, you put in the chat, Billy, stop the blubbering. You're making me blubber. Dan, how are you? Uh, I don't know what he means by that. Oh, you were break. You were you were emotional about the return home, as you should be. And Dan said it was making him emotional, also. Oh, okay. Well, I, yeah. I, I apologize for that, but we all. <laughs> no, it's it's meant as a it's meant that it's meant as a, a compliment that Dan was very moved by that story, Billy. Oh, well, then then I accept that. Yeah, because we <laughs> we all live that same. Yes. <laughs> We all went through those same emotions. There's no question about it. And it was all ranks. It didn't matter what unit you were in, what your job was, whether you were a combat guy, a, a pilot, a, a, no matter what you were doing, we all shared those emotions. The other thing that was difficult about your homecoming is that music had changed. The culture was changing. You arrived just at the beginning of the Summer of Love, 1967, the counterculture took hold nationwide. Here, here you are, uh, a little more than a year after your homecoming. I love this quotation that I found in an article. This is August 1968. This is your, your quoted as saying, a year after I came home from the war, on the road with Jimi Hendrix and the Soft Machine, I was managing the poster sales that month at their concerts for the publishing company Ray and I were signed with as writers. I was out making out a few extra dollars. I was also the only one not doing drugs so they could trust me with the money. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see there's a counterculture right there. And there it is there. But I'm, I'm surprised, Billy. You know, I know you you were candid about your problems with alcohol when you came home, uh, you know, the problems of finding your place. I'm surprised at how quickly you really were able to get back into the music business and start writing songs again. Well, what I did was... Uh, uh, after a year home, uh, my brother got married in June of 68, and I was a total mess at that wedding and, you know, really was crazy drunk on my butt and uh, embarrassed everybody. And uh, I was so drunk, I slept for a day and a half. And I got up that morning, they brought me home to my mother's, uh, my parents' house and put me to bed. And uh, I remember after a day and a half stumbling into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize who I saw. I had a gray ash tone in my skin. My hair was glued to my face. And it wasn't until I, I saw the movie Platoon at the end of which I should have never watched because it was devastating for me but when charlie sheen i remember at the end of that movie when charlie sheen was in the chopper leaving that big battle and he self said that he felt he had a responsibility to go on for the people that didn't make it and that hit home with me because when I went into the bathroom at my mother's home in 1968, a total disaster. And I was leaning over the sink and I looked in the mirror and I said to myself, this is a disgrace. Your mother got her son back. And he, and he walked his, on his own two legs. You owe it. You. You owe it. To every one of those boys and the eight women that never made it home and their mothers to stop this bull 
get it together and figure it out and move on because you owe that. You owe, you owe a debt. And you did it. I made a commitment. And I said, well, I've got to find a genre that I, I can't I can't keep sobbing. I got to find a genre. And I found R&B. And I bought a broken down piano and I said, I can't write this music on guitar. I got to teach myself how to play piano. I did. And I made that commitment the first week in July in 1968. And I was I 20 hours a day. I just I listened, I listened to the genre, I wrote the genre, tied, I hooked up with Ray DeRouge. And in November of 1968, a few months later, I was at the Hit Factory in New York listening to my first top five record being recorded. And I never looked back. And you went on to have a remarkable career. And I'm gonna share a couple of wonderful interviews with you that, that tell your story. And of course, the link to your book that tells the whole story. Uh, but I did want to invite Ken Kazak. You put a good question here in the chat. Ken, if you could unmute yourself and ask it, please do go ahead. Um, um, Billy, um, great story. I, my question was, did you did you develop any lyrics while in Vietnam or any titles or I don't know what you would call it, any um, music notes uh, while you're in Vietnam. Did you do any writing in Vietnam? Songwriting? Uh, yes, but they weren't very good. <laughs> they weren't very good. Well, Lieutenant Clintner and I wrote a couple of songs, uh, but I was I was like in the cracks in Vietnam because I was just coming up in '65 and I wasn't really. Uh, you know, I didn't really have it totally together, and then I went to the war. Uh, but I did, I did write a couple of things in Vietnam, uh, and uh, but it was a, it was much easier when I got back and I found a genre to get into to write more professionally. I was also going to ask uh, Sue Watson. Good to see you, Sue. I haven't seen you in a while, and wonderful comment here. Just thought you might want to say it out loud to Billy. As, uh, Billy, what a compelling story and an amazing storyteller. Um, I felt like I was there. And a lot of what you said, thank you for your courage to do that. Yeah. For sharing the story. It's a it, story we need to hear. I mean, I was, I was a little younger than you are, but certainly knew the Vietnam War. And but uh, but to hear those, yeah, the stories and the thank you. Yeah, well, thank. You. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, uh, Greg Yost, you also had some comments and questions. If you want to unmute yourself, you can do so. Here we go, Greg. Hello. Yes. No, I had wanted to pursue the uh, the angle that you had taken there about uh, about coming back and uh, whether people in the music business, you know, even first of all, did you even tell anyone that you had been in Vietnam uh, or was that sort of a, a secret that you didn't want to let out for business purposes? And did you, um, uh, you know, did, were people trying to sort of capitalize on you, say, hey, you know, like, uh, can you join the anti-war movement or something, you know, for their own purposes? Uh, were, were were people simply not hiring you because you had been to Vietnam? Was sort of, sort of. How did that affect sort of in that late sixties, early seventies? Well, when I first came back, I didn't know the the social climate had uh, changed so much. So frankly, I went back to I went back to New York in my uniform, and I I felt more like I had been let out of prison early, as opposed to serve in the country. So what I did after after about six or eight months of that, and then I when I started the alcohol binge, what I did is I stopped talking about Vietnam completely. And I didn't for many years. Nobody, you know, once I got started getting some momentum, 
Uh, no one knew I even served in the military, let alone was a Vietnam vet, because I let my hair grow and I, you know, I had all the, that, that image. But I, I have to say that uh, I had mixed emotions about what was going on. And uh, I realized at first I, I hated the protest because I, I took offense to it. And I realize now later in life that I took offense to it because uh, back then I felt it was such a slap in the face to all of the horror that I had witnessed and the body bags and all this. And I'm saying, how could you do this when all these young people are, are losing their lives? But I realized, I realized later on that I've come to terms with it because I said to myself, you know what? The organizers of these movements were sincere. They saw something they didn't agree with. They didn't want to see the slaughter of young Americans. And they were speaking out on that. But what I realized that I resented was all the people that joined in with all the pot and all the drugs and all of the protests and spitting on people. That wasn't what it was about. They got hung up in it. And, and it was tragic for me to, 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 to come to the realization that most of the people that, that participated in those protests they were there just to be there. It was just their way of letting out the anger, joining in. It was like a rock concert where the first 20 rows are the, are the fans and the rest of them are there not paying attention to the music, but they want to be there because that's the in place to be. <laughs> I had heard analogy. the same thing. I had heard the same thing that, that, that anti-war protests were in a lot of ways really big parties, basically. It was, it was tragic. It was tragic because I, I and, and later in life, I, I realized there was no, no reason to hate the organizers because they were supporting me. They, they saw something they didn't agree with. They saw something that strategically was not going to work out. And they were in support of me, which I didn't realize when I was 22 years old. But then when I turned it around and I looked, at everything that happened and waited out, all of these other clowns out there just participating to create chaos, it, it diminished. The tragedy for me is that it diminished the validity of the movement. It took away from the movement. Because what they did, they threw cold water on it. You know, Billy, we just were able to scratch the surface of your story tonight. I'm so grateful that you devoted your time and attention with us. Um, I hope you'll join us again and maybe fill us oh, in absolutely. more. Thank you. I'm sorry we did. I'm sorry this video portion crapped out, but uh, but no, this was wonderful. I'll do it any time. And I also want to encourage people to uh, kind of check out Billy's story. You could look up his book. I think we have the, the link here in the chat, The Other Side of Rock and War. Uh, Billy Terrell, your story from, from peace to war to peace again. And there's a lot that we didn't cover. So I do hope that we uh, – one of the things that we didn't cover was your trip to Vietnam. And we're doing a trip to Vietnam this fall, uh, November and December, it will be our third trip to Vietnam. We're doing an information session for anybody interested in traveling with us, or just if you want to hear about what Vietnam is like, what the trip is like. Um, we're doing an information session. Laura Pasuelo, a travel planner, and I will be on uh, Sunday night, uh, April 16th at 7 p.m., and then again April 17th, next Monday, a week from today, at 9 a.m., and then that night, at April 17th, we'll be back with the VBC Happy Hour. We're going to have a bunch of people from No One Left Behind, which is a nonprofit that brings interpreters, rescues interpreters, evacuates interpreters from Iraq and Afghanistan. We're going to have a, an interpreter who's been 
rescued by no one left behind who now serves in the Marine Corps and then some of the veterans who were instrumental in getting them back. Uh, we have a magazine. Our new magazine is at the printer. It should be hitting your mailboxes. It might be as early as a week. It might be in two weeks. This is it. We send it out free of charge. Uh, we print up about 15,000 copies. We'd be happy to put it in the mail to you. Let me know if you don't get it. If you don't get it in the mails because we don't have your address, you can just email me at Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. And then finally, we have our VBC survey. This is a three-question survey. Just ask you, what do you think about this program, how we could improve, what you liked or didn't like about it. Thank you so much for hanging with us tonight to hear Billy's story. Thank you, Sean, for all the work you did here, kind of managing the technology. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope to see you later this week, Buzz Bissinger, or, or at our event in Penn Hills, or a week from tonight with no one left behind. Good night, everybody. Take care. Take care. Thank you, Billy. All right, my pleasure. Anytime. Wow.